We at MAS know that innovative ways of thinking about urban growth and development are crucial for New York to remain a competitive global city and a global treasure. And the 2013 MAS survey on livability tells us that New Yorkers feel the same way. When asked if investing in local businesses and economic development is a priority, 93% of New Yorkers responded that it was, and so can you, I mean, 93% of New Yorkers agreeing on something. I mean, that's <laughs> truly remarkable. Um, so, we're kicking off the afternoon by taking a look at the new economy in cities and how we can build New York City's economic resilience. It's New York's diverse economy, from couture to technology to culture to finance, that makes New York New York. And it's that diversity cultural, social, and economic that makes our city so resilient and enables us to bounce back so strongly time and again. Someone who knows this lesson well is New York City Economic Development Corporation President Kyle Kimball. Appointed by Mayor Bloomberg this August, Kyle leads NYC EDC's efforts to position New York as the global center for innovation in the 21st century. Also joining the summit this afternoon is Greg Clark, an international mentor to and advocate for cities, working with public and private leadership in global urban areas, who will be speaking about what New York and other hubs of the global economy have to learn from each other. Greg comes to us from his home in London, via Tokyo and Abu Dhabi, and will be with us through tomorrow, reminding us that New York City functions within a global ecosystem of world cities. And I'm so glad that a great friend, Lisa Gansky, could be with us today from San Francisco, returning for her second summit appearance. Lisa has curated two discussions this afternoon on the way cities are incubating new economic opportunities that improve the livability and resilience of our cities and neighborhoods by connecting us through the sharing economy. She is an entrepreneur, and author of the best-selling book, The Mesh, Why the Future of Business is Sharing. Lisa is also the founder of Mesh Labs and the Mesh Directory, and I had the great honor of participating in Lisa's brilliant conference earlier this year, The Mesh. We meshed like crazy, it was amazing. Um, please join me in welcoming Kyle, who will be followed by Greg and then by Lisa. Uh, thank you, Vin, and thank you for the Municipal Arts Society for hosting this summit again. Uh, I'm very, very honored to be here, and I'm really honored to introduce uh, the world-renowned policy expert and mentor and really thought leader, uh, Greg Clark, who I've had an opportunity to get to know over the last few weeks. Um, in just a few minutes, Greg will join us to talk about what the world's most competitive cities can learn from one another. And as I hope Greg will affirm, despite increasingly challenging, uh, an increasingly challenging climate, New York City has recently been on a winning streak. Uh, really, at an all-time record high private sector employment. Private sector employment growth has been four times that of the United States since 2002. And in fact, we were recently named the most competitive urban economy uh, by four different publications. But under the leadership of Mayor Bloomberg and Deputy Mayor Steele, who you heard from earlier today, many of New York City's economic development successes have really been born out of a process of self-reflection and awareness with the city itself. And really, our idea was to create a strategy for New York City to remain competitive, given the challenges we face in the 21st century, accolades notwithstanding, we cannot rest on our laurels. So I wanted to briefly identify for you in the few minutes that I have how we have responded. First, we have invested tens of billions to modernize our infrastructure, from basic infrastructure to building out our transportation capacity through bikes and reunification with the waterfront, housing, affordable housing, and completing a third water tunnel just yesterday, elevating this, the issue of resiliency in the face of climate change as a basic infrastructure requirement, to amenities that attract talent to expand the city, like public safety, parks, and cultural amenities, to large-scale development projects like Willits Point and Seward Park that really add vertical and horizontal living, active, and cultural space to areas that we now think of are not on our, on our grid. 
And also, at the same time, we are really working to modernize our underlying economy. And this includes helping legacy industries, which New York City has traditionally been a leader to adopt 21st century business models, integrating technology as a horizontal and not a vertical or a valley, um, like, like others might call it, uh, and really cultivating entrepreneurship across all sectors. So the mayor and the deputy mayor Steele asked us to also identify a single bold initiative, which turned into our applied sciences competition, in which we announced three new applied sciences campuses to induce incremental investment in applied sciences and engineering. And really, we used to be built in the, and across the city um, by some of the world's top research universities, including a $2 billion campus on Roosevelt Island, being developed by Cornell and Israel's uh, Technion University. That will spin out thousands, hundreds of new companies, create tens of thousands of jobs, and produce tens of billions of economic activity over three decades. They will also double the number of full-time engineering graduate students in New York City. So for a relatively modest investment on behalf of the city, we are getting an incredible return. But of course, we have a long ways to go, and as we think about the next steps forward for New York City, we have a lot to learn from other thinkers, organizations, and cities, which is why gatherings like this summit, generally, and, from, uh, and hearing from constructive and critical thought leaders, like Greg specifically, to hold the mirror and let us know that what we can be doing better are also critical to our continued innovation and adaptability and really important events in our city. I know that Greg will talk about strategies that other cities have adopted that we can learn from as we try to address some of our most persistent challenges. I look forward to learning from Greg and from all of you for, uh, during the rest of the summit. Greg? Uh, Kyle, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to the Municipal Arts Society and to all of your sponsors for inviting me here today. As a, a boy who grew up in South London learning to play the trumpet, it was always a dream to one day play in a major jazz venue in New York. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that I'd have to become an urbanist in order to do that. I rather hoped it would be more John Coltrane than Peter Hall, but there you are. Um, this presentation is going to be about New York City and its peers. And um, I'm a person who loves New York City. I consider it, you know, uh, like billions of people, I guess, I cons consider it my second home, and I'm a fan. But in order to be a good fan, I also need to be a critical friend, and I'll try to do a little bit of that as well. The presentation also is not going to talk in great detail about which branch of technology is more important than another or which cluster or sector we should be pursuing. I'm going to try to look in detail at the underpinnings of success in the world's major cities. Now, I've really enjoyed the discussion so far. Um, the conversation about Penn Station has reminded me of the conversations we've had in London over the last 10 years about King's Cross Station and St. Pancras, now our global gateway into Europe and the center of our new medical sciences campus. Uh, the conversation about economic development strategy with the deputy mayor reminded me of Singapore and the miracle that they've had in terms of economic diversification every 10 years. Um, the conversation that we've had about the environment and about placemaking reminded me a lot of the conversation in Tokyo at the moment about the Rapongi Hills and how they become a kind of new district in the city. And then all of the conversations that we've had about art, public realm placemaking have reminded me very much of the agenda that's happening in Paris right now. So this leads me on to really wanting to talk about, if we can get the slides up, please. Yeah, the question of not so much who are New York's peers, but why is it that New York City does have peers, and really who are they? Let me put it in its very simplest way. New York City is, of course, one of the best cities in the world, but it is closely clustered with a group of five other cities that are a kind of big six. These cities are major service centers, they're international gateways, they're hubs for people and for capital. They provide political and cultural leadership, not just within their nations, but across nations and for their whole continents. There was originally for the last cycle or the last two cycles, this strong idea about a big four, New York and London and Paris and Tokyo, but since 2011, and 
substantially reflecting the changes in global economic geography. Singapore and Hong Kong have joined this group very decisively, and there is now a big six, if we can put it that way. Just to look briefly at some of the data that underpins this, I know that this is a conference where we want more images than numbers. I understand that. But these big six, if you look at them here on my chart, there's an increasing gap between them and the other globalizing cities in the world. These big six provide a unique combination, it seems to me, of scale and quality. And all of them are in one way or another on a path towards a newly diverse economy, which we'll talk about in a minute. Let's just observe the very obvious factor that three of these big six cities are now in Asia, reflecting the place that has you know, over 50% of the world's population. Two of them are in Europe, where 6% of the world's population lives. One of them is in North America, where 4% of the world's population lives. So the idea of these world cities is that they connect continents, and of course, the realization is that where the global economy is growing is the future market for all of these cities, not just the places where they're based, which we'll come back to at the end. Now, these cities are still leaders in financial services. I think it's very important that in this conversation about the next economy, we don't assume that the old economy is somehow finished. In fact, in financial services, there are new niches. Ethical finance, Islamic finance, shared financing, financing of foreign exchange in the RMB, financing of foreign exchange in Middle Eastern currencies. There are new niches in the financial sector that are important sites for competition for these cities. But at the same time, as Kyle rightly said in his remarks, media, medicine, life sciences, engineering, clean tech, high tech, ICT, tourism, culture, higher education as a tradable service, all of these things have become the new tradable services of these world cities. Let me put this by making two points. One, these established global cities are diversifying their economy so that they're not so dependent on one, but at the same time using that one to fuel growth. On the other hand, these other sectors are rapidly globalizing, and therefore there are many other routes into becoming a world city. A hundred years ago, you had to be a capital city or you had to be a kind of military center. 50 years ago, you had to become a center in finance and business services. In order to be a world city today, you can be a world city like Tel Aviv is becoming a world city in technology. You can become a world city by becoming a center of decision making like Vienna is becoming. You can become a world city by being a, a place that hosts global events like Melbourne is doing in Australia. So there isn't one model anymore of success. And each of these world cities these established big six has the interesting challenge of how to accommodate new dimensions in cities that are relatively mature and well established. Now in general, this calls for a broader understanding of what is talent. It calls for different models of entrepreneurship, business formation and creation. It calls for what is often called a new ecosystem for the economy which has very specific requirements in terms of place and space. It has specific roles for institutions that are otherwise not very active. And it requires a different kind of local climate, a climate of collaboration, as we'll discover. So the challenge for New York and for London and for Tokyo and for Paris in particular is how to build the ecosystem for the new economy whilst also continuing to enjoy and to in reinvest in the old economy. Now, I said that a lot of this presentation was about trying to understand the underpinnings of success. So not the explicit question about the amounts of venture capital available for the firms in particular sectors or the particular qualifications of the entrepreneurs. It's more about what creates the right kind of environment for the new economy to succeed? So here's some of the things. 
Of course, historic advantages and roles are very important. Four of these six cities happened to be cities that had something to do with the British Empire. <laughs> right? What was the legacy of the British Empire? The English language, the Anglo-American capital and legal system, our preferred system of intellectual property protection, our instincts to trade and to collaborate, our desire to facilitate through logistics global value chains. Some of those legacies of empire weren't all that bad. I feel very strange saying this in New York, but <laughs> four of these six cities share some DNA that's about the trading instincts of the 18th and 19th century that were very important. And we mustn't forget, of course, that the DNA of this city particularly owes something to the Dutch. And when they founded New Amsterdam, they brought that Dutch spirit of trade and entrepreneurship and collaboration that was always there. So historic advantages and roles are pretty clear. Strategic locations in time zones, the North American time zone, but also a knowledge zone, a zone where particular knowledge is exchanged and encouraged, a, a capital of knowledge in the North American time zone, not just a capital of money. Political stability with the different kinds of democracy that exist in these six, they're all there, and a long record of investment in key assets. This is a theme we'll come back to in a few minutes, but a long record of investing time over time over time in key assets, in infrastructure, in digital platforms, in energy systems, in water, in healthcare, in education, in housing, in parks, yeah? A long tradition of investing in them. So all of these things mattered. And then some other important things, reputations as safe havens, not just safe havens for private equity, safe havens for talent, safe havens for ideas, ideas that are protected by intellectual property, yeah? safe havens for religious minorities, safe havens for people facing persecution, safe havens for people who want to lead a different lifestyle than the rest. Yeah? These are very important ideas. Records of tolerance and diversity, and with tolerance and diversity comes creativity, innovation, opportunity. A range of skills and information and experiences that enable them to acquire a know-how that is fundamentally applicable to all sorts of different sectors. World-class higher education institutions, as we know, becoming increasingly important, and Mayor Bloomberg's initiative that Kyle referred to, of course, is the wonder of the rest of the world. Everybody else is figuring out how can we do our applied sciences competition and our applied sciences campus. And then this idea of a compelling brand, identity, reputation, confidence, trust, a sense of belonging, sense of participation. The role that a brand plays in building a sense of affiliation between people and a place. It works very well. So these brands play a role in having a shared story about the future of the city. So these are the underpinning ingredients of a world city's success. And I hope what you'll see in the point I'm making is that some of these things are extremely cultural, some of them are institutional, some of them are to do with what we know about drivers of productivity and business climate and all those other things that I talk with my economist friends about, but these are a broader set of preconditions that are necessary. Now, just recently, um, the Brookings Institution published a report called The Ten Traits of Global Fluency, which I was very pleased to be uh, a co-author of. And we tried to do a version of explaining what are these ten ingredients that I've just described to you. I won't go through them again. It's a slightly different formulation here. But I think that one of the key issues that New York faces and London faces and Paris and Tokyo face in particular, and Hong Kong faces this, is how to deal with the unintended consequences of success. An awful lot of what we think of as New York's problems or London's problems are the consequences of success, they're not the consequences of failure. Now this may seem a very obvious point, but until you understand that you're trying to manage the consequences of success rather than eradicate the causes of congestion, inflation, uh, you know, a sense of, uh, uh, um, you know, too much interaction, uh, claustrophobia, till you realize that this is a manifestation of success, you can't really manage it very effectively. 
So what I want to do then is to make a quick comment about the fact that these six cities are in some ways at a point in time when they look very similar. But in fact, they're on slightly different development paths and they're at different points in their evolutionary cycle as cities. And I want to say something about when we look forward to this new economy, uh, what are their strengths? Now, this is probably the slide that New York media will take and reprint because this is the one where New York scores one, one, and one, okay? For ICT-based infrastructure, for global brand, for R&D institutions, New York against the rest of the big six, how well are you doing? Amazing. These are ingredients of success for the new economy, New York scoring highly, some of this inherited, some of this intentional, you can take credit for this. On the other hand, there are some big six weaknesses, and it's not so much that of that's the other cities in the big six that are outscoring New York, but if you look at sustainability, where New York is 59, or you look at uh, living and business costs where New York is 23, or you look at governance where it's 10, or you look at quality of life where New York is 56. This is against broad bands of other cities through reputable, and, uh, reputable benchmarks with good methodologies, and I explain what each of them are here. What you can see is that New York City doesn't score so well on some of these measures, but also the other members of the big six don't score so well either. So this does not mean that these things will prevent the cities from succeeding, but rather that optimizing the performance of these cities involves getting into these new areas, which are part of the ingredients of success in the new economy, but haven't been traditionally part of what these cities have done particularly well. Now, obviously, we'll come on to other aspects of that shortly. Now, can the big six uh, cooperate, or do they have to compete with each other? There's a general point, I think, that these top six cities do not compete with each other in many head-to-head -head interactions. They are largely the leaders of their time zones and their knowledge zones, as I've explained. There is occasional direct competition, such as between London and Paris or between Singapore and Hong Kong. New York has no direct competitor in its time zone, but... There are other cities like the smaller world cities, San Francisco, Toronto, the emerging world cities, Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, Mexico City, where you do have to think that competition for some of New York's niches will come eventually, where the balance between cost factors, market access factors, and everything else is important. Hence the need to build a collaborative and more sharing agenda. One of the sources of competition is what I like to call the emerging world cities. Here they're in orange. The established world cities are in blue. What you see, I hope, is that the rise of these big cities in the emerging economies and their increasing sophistication in Sao Paulo, in Shanghai, in Istanbul, in Moscow, these places are becoming genuine competitors and are not just scoring highly on the hard factors where they are investing much more than all of us in their infrastructure and everything else, but they're also doing much better on the soft factors. They are making huge progress in all of these things from business climate through to institutional presence. And one big difference between these emerging world cities and the story we heard about New York this morning, of course, is that these cities enjoy absolutely and fundamentally the, undis the undistracted support of their national governments. Their national governments are their biggest fans. Their national governments are mobilizing investment in them so that they can be competitive entities in the new global economy to benefit their nations. It's a completely different understanding of the role of big cities in national economies. Now, if we look at what the rest of the world has been learning from New York over this time, I think these things will be very obvious to you, and I will go through them quite quickly. But clearly, New York has a reputation for long-term uh, openness and talent attraction and its, uh, its desire to trade and to trade ideas and goods and capital. Clearly, New York uh, is famous for entrepreneurship, for brand, for strong city leadership, for a balanced economy, for culture, knowledge production, and the arts. One big message I want to give you today is that, if I can put it this way, all cities have their own DNA. New York has its own DNA. 
London has its own DNA. The DNA of New York and London and actually Hong Kong is quite similar, given what we said about history. No city can succeed if it compromises and corrupts its own DNA. If you attack your own DNA, it's like a corporation killing your own brand. You can't survive if you kill your brand. A city can't survive if it corrupts its own DNA. So we'll come back in a minute to the importance of New York having a set of strategies that continue to support its DNA. In long-term openness, the world has learned from New York that diversity, openness, creativity, opportunity somehow reinforce each other. Singapore has learned more from New York about this than any other nation and I think has an incredibly proactive agenda around openness and talent attraction. On entrepreneurship, New York has shown the world over successive generations that there is a spirit of entrepreneurship, there is a trading instinct, there is a desire to sell, a desire to buy, a desire to make, a desire to innovate here that is second to none. Paris is trying to learn from this very much at the moment with its whole new strategy about hub starts and new uh, entrepreneurial districts. When we come to brand, I would think I would be right in saying that New York City probably has the most copied city brand in the world. New York City was in some senses the first city to really brand itself in this kind of way. And if you think about what Hong Kong is doing at the moment, to position itself as Asia's world city, it says again and again, Hong Kong wants to be in Asia what New York is in America and what London is in Europe. So you can see that. City leadership, where you have benefited from successive generations and from institutional strength. Many achievements here, but when London invented its new city government in 2000, it looked to New York. And it tried in the new governance arrangements of London to combine a New York-style mayor with a German-style regional parliament and stick them together into one kind of thing. So imagine the chutzpah of New York and the efficiency of Germany all rolled up into one. We're, we're still waiting to see it, I have to say. Um, New York's balanced economic base has been very important. The fact that New York deliberately retained manufacturing at a time when other world cities allowed it to decline. New York didn't do that. That's been to its great success, and all the cities are trying to learn from that. And at the same time, culture, culture arts, knowledge production, I would suggest that New York City was the first city to really understand that culture and the arts, placemaking, these are ingredients of magnetism in a city that attracts and retains talent and corporate investment and everything else. And Hong Kong is trying to learn from that right now. It has realized that there's a culture gap that it really needs to fill and is trying to work very hard on it. So I hope you're all feeling very good now about New York and like what it's contributed to the world. And here's a way of showing what it's done. Lots of assets here, compelling brand, leadership, opportunity, history of global orientation. On the Brookings measure of the 10 traits of global fluency, New York is way up there. Now, are there any areas where New York is perhaps not doing so well and could learn from some others? Here's my suggestion. Three kind of threats. Number one, securing investment for long-term priorities. This is a critical ingredient for all cities. You heard the conversation I heard here this morning, the difficulty of creating an investment model around Penn Station, the difficulty of creating an investment model around different aspects of infrastructure, the difficulty of making the case and winning the case. That seems to me to be there. The second one, connectivity. New York's connectivity, by world city standards, is average. And the gap is growing because the other world cities are investing more in heavily in it. The third one, enabling government. If you heard what I said about the emerging world cities and the support they enjoy from their national governments, you'll know that this is an issue. There's an issue here of federal adoption of New York. There's an issue of the tri-state region and the difficulty of coordinating that. But there's an issue here of state and city and how they work together. So if we were to think about New York's next agenda, getting ready for the new economy, what might it need to do? Let's go quite quickly because time is running out. 
Regional growth management, adopting a governance model that allows you to manage the new geography of the city, not just to manage the old geography of the city. One of the things I think when I come to New York is that you are absolutely optimizing everything it's possible to do well within the boundaries of the city. And yet so many of the issues that you now face are outside the boundaries of the city and therefore require some kind of regional system to make it work. Such a regional system as, uh, as exists, for example, if we think of regional connectivity uh, in Tokyo, where Tokyo is investing in a supra-regional program just the way Paris has done. So regional governance, regional connectivity. If we put the Paris Regional Infrastructure Investment Plan onto Manhattan Island and the rest of New York, it would look like this. This is what they're doing in the next 10 years. This is what $30 billion buys you in terms of new infrastructure. This is what's happening. If we look at the next, uh, or we, if we look to the Pearl River Delta, regional infrastructure in the Pearl River Delta, connecting Guangzhou with Hong Kong, high-speed rail, exactly the project that Bob Yarrow was talking about this morning, happening in the Pearl River Delta, still a matter of debate and discourse and dispute about whether it will happen here. Third issue where New York might learn, achieving affordability, affordability in housing in particular, a big successful world city challenge, a consequence of success is inflation in the housing market. Paris and Tokyo leading the way here, new forms of institutional investment, new micro unit style apartments, new fractional equity approaches to enable people to get into the housing market. National support for openness, one of New York's challenges in the last period of time, national immigration policy that hasn't quite helped. Singapore has led the way here with a new approach to immigration policy, very much based on combining economic need with some kind of liberal ideas about openness. And if you, if you look there at the uh, numbers around international students, of course, New York is doing well, but it's not doing as well as the other places. Educational attainment, Hong Kong has found a way to have public schools that equalize for income levels. So that young people from poor families and young people from rich families do not have differential levels of educational attainment. It's probably a very un-American idea to put to you. I appreciate that. But Hong Kong and even Toronto in Canada, of course, have done very well here. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna to get to the end quite quickly. New sources of international investment. New York, has tended to look largely to Europe for international institutional investment. If you accept the new geography of global trade and global investment, New York needs to look more internationally just to catch up with London and Hong Kong uh, on these charts. New York is a global decision taker. We talked about the consolidation of the UN earlier. It always surprises me, Paris makes a huge amount of being the headquarters of the OECD. Even Washington DC these days makes a lot about being the headquarters of the World Bank. I never see a story from New York about what being the headquarters of the UN really means. And New York has the capital of decision taking for the world. An underutilized asset, I would say. So, could the big six cooperate on these kinds of agendas? And if they did, what might they do? Well, I think the C40 was an excellent initiative, and Michael Bloomberg, of course, should take credit for this initiative. At the heart of the C40 was not just collaboration between the 40 biggest cities in the world, but also this idea of building a sharing economy amongst them, where they could collaborate in a kind of purchasing consortium around new technologies, new ideas in climate change. I think we might find that there could be more for the big six to do together on making the business case for openness, on a, figuring out really how to build tech zones in mature cities where they don't usually happen, in finding this new form of entrepreneurship that exists in the new economy, strategies for globalization, new investment methods, and of course, supporting national policies for world cities, just like is happening in Brazil and China and Russia and India. Now, last slide. If you were to do all of this, would it make any difference? Well, my view would be something like this, that America in the 20th century looked inward to fuel its success. America was the country that was producing the new technology. It had the new democracy. It had the new quality of life. It had the Anglo-American business system around it. And New York 
was the global hub for this dominant national economy that was America. It was the place that connected tourism and migrants and ideas and capital and art and everything else. But I think that the world is changing a lot. And in the 21st century, America will not be the biggest source of growth, even though it will, of course, continue to be a successful economy. And it won't be that 20th century models of success will work in the same way in the 21st century. N America will not be peerless. And New York, I think, will want to review its model of success in that light. So in the next 10 years, if we did some of the collaborations I've talked about, I think you'd end up with a New York that had stronger regional governments, better tactics with national government, housing and educational standards that were improved, an investment rate in infrastructure that would increase, and New York City's leadership would be extended to the geography beyond the boundaries of the city. Now, if some of this can happen, I think New York City will renew its DNA, and it will align itself with its past, its present, and its future, so that its skill and its acumen in city building and in place making and street life and what I would call a kind of designed freedom will once again come to the fore and New York will be the inspiring city of the 21st century as well. Thank you very much indeed.